Hey everyone, thanks for tuning back into the Way of Rudis Wrestling Podcast. I'm Matt Dernlin with my co-host Kerry Colat, and today we're going to be jumping into Chapter Two of Make Your Bed. And in this chapter, what we talk about is you can't go it alone. And this is really unique to the sport of wrestling because we're such an individual sport. We're so focused upon on what we have to do as individuals that a lot of times we don't really, you know, recognize that it actually, we're only successful as the people that we surround ourselves with. So Carrie and I have a lot of fun, not only talking about the individual nature of the, of the sport of wrestling, but how critical it is to really surround yourself with the right people. And not only as teammates, as coaches, but mentors and leaders that surround us. So we had a lot of fun uh, jumping into this. This has been a really fun book. I hope you guys are getting engaged with it um, as much as we are. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to everyone that really um, embraced our Rocky release last week. Um, We had a, a huge, huge outpouring of support for our new line of Rocky. Um, I'd also like to let you guys know that we, we, uh, just received a bunch of new women's product, um, for our online purchases. So if you want to jump online to the rudest.com, you can check out our new women's apparel as well. Um, and this actually coincides perfectly with final X coming up with the, the female athletes that we've signed in the last couple months, uh, Sarah Hildebrandt, Kayla Miracle, and on Monday we'll be releasing our, our newest uh, women's athlete heading into Final X next weekend at Rutgers. So, anyways, I hope you guys enjoy Chapter 2 of The Way. Um, enjoy. Hey, everyone. This is uh, Kerry Colat, Matt Derlin with the, the podcast The Way. Um, just a, a simple show to help you if you're a coach, parent, athlete, um, how to lead a team, how to become a leader. Uh, right now, we're reading the book by Admiral William McRaven, Make Your Bed. Um, today we're in chapter two and, and talking a little bit about how he says you can't go it alone. Um, if you don't know Admiral McRaven, he's the, the he's got a pretty famous YouTube uh, story out there where he gave a speech to um, uh, Texas University and um, was it Texas University, man? I get confused on those days. Texas Tech and everything else. Yeah, he was actually. I think he was an undergrad at the University of Texas and be- before yeah. his uh, military career, and so. He gave a commencement speech at the University of Texas. I think in I think this came out in 2014. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, you can go and always you know search it on YouTube, and you'll find his speech, and it, it, it gained so much traction that he wrote down his his principles in the in the book Make Your Bed. Um, so so anyway, Matt, uh, how'd your week go, man? Good, good. Uh, interesting, interesting time. A lot going on. Um, I'm sure you're geared up. What do you, you guys just got out of school a week or so ago? No, no, a few weeks ago. And, and, um, my guys are all getting ready for Akron. We've got uh, more guys than we've ever had back in the summer training. And I think we have, I think there's 26, 28 guys I counted yesterday, um, that are getting ready for Akron. Not all of them will go. Some got summer school and it's going to make it a little difficult, but, um, but yeah, they're up in, in rocking and rolling, man. And, and, um, but anyway, um, you want to start us off here and, and we'll get into the book in chapter two. You can't go it alone. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the the biggest things I think, you know, back is being a coach, being an athlete, going through these experiences. This is one of the biggest things that you, you any any individuals need to, to wrap their mind around. And that's, you know, you can't go it alone. You you actually need people in your life around you. And I think as, as competitors and as coaches, like – our human instinct is to think we're, we're so self-reliant, so, so self-motivated that we can actually accomplish anything, that we don't need anybody around us. And I think that's that's the good and the bad of the sport of wrestling, right? You know, we, we, we always teach guys, hey, when you're out there, that's the beauty of the sport. Your success and failures are all on you. And so I think sometimes we have a tendency to want to isolate ourselves and pull ourselves away and it's like, I got to get my own world. If I'm going to achieve the success I want to achieve, I got to get my own world. I can only rely on myself, you know, but really in life, in sports, anything, you're only as successful as the people around you. Right. And you've got to get to the point where you're actually, you know, open, not vulnerable. It's almost a level of vulnerability, right? Saying I need help. I need, I, if I'm going to succeed, 
if I'm going to, as an athlete, as a coach, you know, as a professional, whatever it is, you know, I've got, I've got to put my faith in the, in those around me. And that's, that's a tough thing. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you can identify with it, you know, in the levels of success that you, you had and, and you can probably relate it back to your own career, even, even better than most and how you, what, what triggered you to the point where you're like, I, I need somebody else. Yeah. From, uh, for me, it's really specific. You know, if, if my wife was on the show, she would tell you exactly when it happened. But, you know, I was, I was re- so self-sufficient, um, about my training. At least I thought it was, um, I was very organized, right? I, I knew when I was going to run, I knew when I was going to lift. And, and I looked at all that as being self-sufficient and, and, um, and I learned to push myself when, when nobody was around, right? That's what, what, you know, great, great athletes over time start to do. You have to be able to, you know, train yourself when there's nobody there, no partner and go on the run and still push yourself or, you know, get in there and get the shadow wrestling and still push yourself. But, you know, so I got, um, I didn't realize how much I needed my training partner. You know, I tell my guys, my, my freshmen, when they come in, you know, develop a relationship with somebody who's that main guy. You say, hey, let's go run. Let's go lift. Let's go drill. Right. And you develop that relationship. You can always count on that person. You got to figure who that person is going to figure out who it's going to be on your team. And so when I first went to Penn State, I just started to form this connection with Sinchiro Abe. You know, it's funny. We just saw each other this weekend at the NHSA duels. And, um, and so we formed this connection. We, we, and, and eventually to the point where I said, I gotta, I gotta live with this guy. I moved in with him. We ran together. We drilled together. Um, he was trying out for the, you know, the Japan, uh, world and Olympic teams. And, you know, I was trying to make the U S world and Olympic teams. And, um, you know, in 96, he made his Olympic team and I traveled over there with him and I, and I, I helped him prep for it. Um, he made the team. I coached him through his world team trials. I mean, his Olympic team trials process back in 96, they, they picked their team back in December. Um, you know, and, and then my main quad, I didn't make my world team until like 97. So, so 97 to 2000 was going to be my quad. And, and, um, so I was at Lock Haven then and Sonny was at, um, state college. We lived in the same town of Belfont, which is between the two. Um, and we trained together and then we'd go to our college practices and train there. And then in 98, he just said, Hey man, I, I, I'm done. You know, he had already made a, the 95 world team had been in the 96 Olympics had made the 97 world team, made the 98 world team. And he, and I could tell something was wrong. And he just said, Hey, I'm, I'm done, you know, and, and, um, and I, I asked him, I kind of like confronted him about it. I was like, Hey, you're showing up late for practice. You know, uh, you just, the effort's <laughs> not the same. He was quitting more. And I had this sense that I kept telling my wife, I said, I think this guy is going to retire on me. And, and he did. And, and that was his prerogative. But when he retired, man, it, it turned me into a spiral. Like people ask me why, um, I, everybody always assumes I was coaching. They say, oh, he was at Lehigh. Then he was at Wisconsin. And then he was at West Virginia. I've always thought I was bouncing my career, but what they don't understand, I wasn't coaching at that time in my career. I was, I was that guy on staff, but I was there to train. And I was constantly out searching for that same connection, that same training partner. And I had good partners, but I had never built that connection I had with Abe. And, you know, I realized that what I thought I was going it alone, I really wasn't. You know, and, and that's when I realized that I realized how, how badly I needed someone in pew. You know, so when I always say my best training years were my best training years came before 1998 when Abe was still competing um, because he was that main go to guy. And I had John and Russ Hughes as well. Um, and they were awesome, you know, but Sonny was that, that main guy for me. We were about the same size and everything worked. But yeah, you can't. And when you, when you real, the day you wake up and realize you can't go it alone. Man, it's, it's shocking, and, and especially as a Navy SEAL, you know, with the type of work that they do, and he talks in the book about, you know, they make them carry the rubber raft for that reason because they know some guy is going to get hurt or get sick. He's not going to be able to pick up the, the weight, and what they want to see is if the team's going to fall apart. Are they going to turn on that guy, or are they going to be, hey, sometimes somebody's down, and when somebody's down, you got to pick it up, and that's the same way a wrestling dual meet goes. You know, you might be counting on a guy and one day one of your guys who you always count just isn't there. You know, he's just not there. And then you need that guy who isn't that guy always, you know, stepping up that needs to step up and pick up the slack, you know, and, and that's how you build a successful team. And that's what the, the Navy SEALs are great about doing is is getting guys to pick up the slack, um, you know, and they don't baby each other. That's for sure. 
and uh, you know help each other out. But yeah, you can't you can't go it alone. You need that guy. Yeah, because eventually we're we're going to be the guy that can't hold up the boat, and uh, and we we never want to be that guy. And it's the hardest thing to really wrap your mind around. Like I'm not at my best. I I need to rely on somebody else. And when you when you have these shared experiences, when you're going through these extreme situations, it it unknowingly or unknowingly it it just builds up a level of trust and camaraderie right and you know the one thing that i would always tell my my guys you know before a dual meet is hey be prepared to be that step up guy one of you guys is going to have to be that step up guy today because you don't you didn't want to point it out but the reality of the situation is one of the 10 that, that steps out on the mat that night for whatever reason, whatever it is, injury, a bad weight cut, whatever, school, distractions, whatever, someone's not going to be at their best. So be prepared to be that step-up guy. Be prepared to, to be that guy that carries the extra weight of the boat above your head as you're, as you're traveling down the beach because you may be that guy the next time around. You don't want to and you don't prepare for that, but – when you have a level of trust and camaraderie, when there's that all all in commitment from those people around you, you know, you can have a level of, of faith and trust that opens yourself up. Like, yeah, I can rely on these guys, and I think you know, not only as a competitor, but but in coaching too, right? Uh, you know, the one thing that, that I, I I learned during coaches in my coaching career is like, hey, seek out the best guys, surround yourself with the best guys. Don't don't feel the need like. I've got to do it all, all on my own, um, because the the strength of your program, you're only going to grow the program, you know, as as successfully as the strength of the people that are, are around you. And that's not just in coaching, but I know for for me, you know, one of the things that I I learned to rely on in coaching is is my wife. And you know, I, I used to tell people all the time, like in this career that I've that I've chosen. If I didn't have a committed wife, two things would happen pretty quickly. Either I was going to get out of coaching, number one, or get divorced because there's such a level of dedication in, in coaching. It's no different than than being an athlete, right? You've, you've got to be all in every day. And, you know, I know for me personally, if I didn't have my wife to keep me grounded, to keep me, you know, having perspective in my life and what I was trying to do, there was no way I, I was going to be able to do it successfully at all. So, you know, I think that's some, some of the things you hear from coaches a lot, but I think living it, you understand like how critical your, your wife is, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, when I look back on my coaching career, she was lifting the boat equally or more so than, than I was, you know, and I didn't even, even realize it because she was taking care of things at home, things I didn't have, you know, didn't have to worry about, you know, teaching our kids and, and doing certain things. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's critical that it's, it's not just you and your coaches and your athletes. It's, it's everybody around you. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody who's in a, in a serious relationship knows that and they start to figure that out. If you don't figure it out, then you have problems. But yeah, I mean, I a hundred percent agree with you there, Matt, you know, my, you know, Aaron has picked up a lot of slack for me over the years and, and, um, you know, and I, I think it, no matter what the occupation is, there's always parts to a, a, any kind of relationship. I think when I come back to this chapter, you know, what I had to learn as a coach, and, and I'm still learning it. I, you know, I don't have everything solved or by no means. You know, my, my team is still progressing. We still haven't accomplished a lot of things that other teams have accomplished, and we're just kind of figuring it out as we go. But, um, one, I had to trust my assistants, you know. I mean, no, no real man wants to be um, – you know, stood over his shoulder and, and everything he does second guessed, you know, and, and you have to let your, your assistants, uh, you know, m make mistakes and also create wins for the program and give them credit when they create those wins, you know, and, um, you know, that's one of it. I, I feel like I've been lucky with my staff um, and the guys I got, you know, and, and my whole goal now is, I, you know, there's days I wake up like I don't want to lose these guys, you know, and, and that's part of coaching too, right? We always have this merry-go-round that happens with head coaches and assistant coaches at the end of the year. And you never know if a guy's just ready to go and, and, and learn under somebody else. Um, probably the biggest part about this, and this is the hard part, and I know in Switch we talked about it, but is keeping your, you know, your, your number twos engaged. Like keeping that guy who's not in the lineup 
but they got to be ready. They have to be ready. They have to be maintaining their weight. You know, you can't have that guy all of a sudden your, your starter gets, you know, a skin infection two days before and your, your, your number two is 18 pounds overweight because he didn't anticipate wrestling. Like that is the part that you have to show them. Like, and so we talk to our guys all the time, even though you're not in the lineup, that guy wouldn't be winning unless you were chasing him. He wouldn't be as, as competitive as he is if you weren't chasing him for his spot. And when you're not achieving that spot that you're helping to continue to lift him up because you lift the program and then next year you're going to get your chance again, you know, and, and that's the hardest part about coaching and anybody's coaches has known that is keeping those guys engaged, especially in our sport because you don't get extra playing time. It's not football or basketball where a guy gets some plays every now and then, or they rotate a guy for a break. We don't, we don't really get that option. Um, unless you have such a highly successful team that you're so strong that you, you've got so much depth that you can do that, but not everybody has that luxury. And, um, that's the hardest part, you know, it, what I have found in coaching, because you can't do it with just 10 guys, you know, you need the training partners, you need the, the, the starter uh, uh, to some extent, knowing that if, if I don't continue to make gains, there's a guy right behind me that's coming for this spot. Um, you need to have that. And that's the, that's the difficult part. And as a coach, you know, there's, you know, there's a few ways. I, I did that with team bonding and, and team dinners. And I do a lot of times in the preseason, you know, we don't bring in and say, here's our guy. I bring in, you know, the weight classes that I coach, I bring them in together. You know, because early in the season, you still don't always know, even though they might we might have had to wrestle off and have an idea who the starter is going to be. We continue to train those guys together so they become within the team. They become their own team around their weight classes. And that builds a little unity and that keeps the guy excited. And, and when we're all learning things together and the other guys going out and performing it and hitting it, you know, they all feel like, hey, man, we worked on that. and You hit it. You know, you start building that unity. And that's important. Um, yeah. And just so a, the backups. Yeah. It's just there. yeah. It's just. Tying this back to the book is like you, your 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 teams and your groups, whether it's that you know lightweights, middleweights, upper upper weights. If you're forcing everybody, not just the starting guy, you're you're forcing everybody to carry the boat every day. It's not just hey, these guys, th- these are the three or four guys that are going out, you know, for our lightweights to compete for. Us, so they just carry the boat this week. No. Every, everybody's got to do their part. There's an equal amount of investment, even though the, there's only one guy or two guys, you know, in your area that are going to put on the singlet, you've got to force each guy to carry the boat every, every single day and every, every, every part of your, your preparation. And, you know, that's, you were referencing the same thing. And I would, would challenge my guys all the time. Like, Hey, if you're, if you're the 125 pounder, you better be not, I hope you're knocking on my door saying, Hey coach, what other 25 pounders are you bringing in? As opposed to a lot of guys are thinking, no, I just want this spot for my, my, myself. I don't want any competition. The, the great guys are like, coach, bring me competition. That's going to sharpen me. That's going to steal me. That's going to prepare me even better. So I can't just, you know, I can't go it alone in my weight class. I need competition. I need depth. And the great ones always run to that, right? They, they lean into challenges. They want, they, they want, you know, the challenge of having to compete every single day. And when you're competing together and you're building up that com- camaraderie, you know, that's, you know, how you accomplish something great and you, you can't do it alone. I mean, that just comes back to the title of, of the chapter and, you know, our success is dependent on others and getting to the point where we can depend on others, rely on people and understand it's, it's critical to our growth and success of our our teams and our programs and our individuals is we've got to rely on those, those around us. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I mean, I think to, to sum up chapter two and, and my key takeaways are, are this, if you're an athlete, you know, listening to this podcast in this, in this chapter, um, find that stable training partner who's going to run, lift, drill with you has the same mindset um, and you don't realize how, how much of a benefit you're going to get. And sometimes you create that partner, you know, sometimes you may not have it. And what, you know, I used to do this at Lock Cave and I'd grab the freshmen and I'd start creating like-minded people. Like I, you know, I'd, I'd make those guys come in and drill and I'd make them go run with me and I'd make them live with me. And, you know, I'd give them a hard time if they were late. Um, and as a coach, you know, I think the big takeaway is here is, is building those, that unity within your groups, um, having your number two, 
ready to go and feel like he's he's you know part of the program even if he's not always out there in light and that's we both all know that's a hard job but that's the main part of the job is is keeping those guys going so your number ones are always ready to go and, and getting better and improving and, and they're ready to pick up the slack and training your team that you know we can't rely on just a couple guys in the program somebody's going to have a setback and so you know there's really nothing unexpected because we train hard enough to win every time we step on the mat, you know, and that's got to be the mindset. But, well, Matt, I, I appreciate it, man. It was it was uh, another good talk if you're listening. And, you know, this is uh, Make Your Bed by uh, Admiral William McRaven. Um, great little book. It's, you know, probably 50, 60 pages, uh, a few chapters, and, and awesome if you're, if you're leading a program or leading a, a, a group. Um, this is a great book to pick up and read. All right, Kerry, we will uh, talk to you next time. All right, man. Take care.